I want you to go right now to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 13, verse 12 through 15, and there you will find the word of the Lord that I'm going to share this morning. Can you say amen? amen. And the word of the Lord reads like this, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him, let us go therefore unto him, let us go therefore unto him, without, without the camp, without the camp, we're, we're going to have to get out of the camp, bearing, bearing his reproach, come on, for we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Somebody shout amen. amen. Somebody shout amen again. Amen. I want to go back to that phrase where the Bible said that he died without the camp, meaning he died outside of the camp. And I want to use the subject, he bled out. He bled out. Look at your neighbor and say, he bled out. Uh, and he, he, didn't, he didn't bleed in. He, he, he bled out. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that the word would be made flesh while it's being preached. That it would strengthen us where we need it most. That it would edify our souls in all areas that edification is needed those areas in our lives that have been torn down and need to be remodeled, you can rehab us through this message. You can renovate us through this message. You can reinvigorate us through this message. You can regenerate us through this message. You can revive us through this message. Great God that you are. We take our hands off the situation. You take over and do whatever you want to do. You're God all by yourself. Nobody appointed you to be God. Nobody elected you to be God. Nobody campaigned for you to be God. Since no man can put you in, no man can take you out. And we give you the praise with all of our might and all of our hearts and all of our strength. We thank you for what you're about to do. Have your way in this place. Have your way in this place. Have your way in this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Yeah, let's go to work. <laughs> I'm coming out of the book of Hebrews, and to me it is one of the most beautiful, one of the most well-written, one of the most poetic, one of the most profound, one of the most prolific books of the New Testament. The epistle we call Hebrews is quite profound and prolific, although there are some debates about who wrote the book. Most theologians agree that Apollos, in all likelihood, wrote the book as opposed to Paul. You will hear Paul talk about Apollo in Corinthians, when he talks to the Corinthian church because Apollo had been through Corinth. And when Paul got back to Corinth, that's all they were talking about was Apollo. And he had to kind of defend himself. I came not to you with swelling words, no excellency of speech, but in fervency of the spirit. What does it matter that some say you are Apollos and some say that you are a Paul? If one man planteth, another man watereth, but God gives the increase. It was years of reading that word before I began to realize that Paul sounds like he's a little intimidated. If you read over in Acts chapter 18 or 19, I think it is, you'll find where Paul was described as being, Apollos was described as being fervent in the scriptures and mighty in the spirit. And the Bible describes him as this very profound, prolific writer. And I believe that that adds to the texture of the text. While God is the ultimate author, the writer expresses themselves in different styles. So from chapter, to, from book to book, you will see stylistic differences in how the descriptions are made, but God is the author. There's a difference between being the author and being a writer. The author has the message, the writer writes the message. There's a difference between those two things. So this book is authored by God, but it is written by various people. Often various people from different ages and different dispensations. 
often from Genesis to Revelation, the ones who wrote Genesis never met the ones who wrote Revelations. And what the mystery of the Bible is, is that there is a continuity of thought, a fluidity of wit that perpetuates itself regardless who the writer is. Because we have many writers, but we only have one author. Come on, somebody. So it's important that you understand that to appreciate the demographics of the text. The second thing I want to say as a preliminary before we get into the text, the very name of the book itself suggests something that we must discuss a little bit. The, the, the fact that the book is called Hebrews points to the fact that God is not colorblind. Yes, sir. Wow. He is not, that is to say, he is not oblivious to culture. A lot of times, well-meaning Christians often say, I'm colorblind, but that if, unless you are colorblind, you don't need to say that I'm colorblind to excuse differences in people because God intended differences in people. So whatever color you are, white, red, yellow, brown, or something in between, you don't have to look over my color. You can look through my color. In fact, appreciate my color. Appreciate my ethnicity. Appreciate what I bring to the table. I appreciate what you bring to the table. We don't have to look over each other no more than I have to look over you being a woman or you have to look over me being a man. God wouldn't have made you a woman and then created you in such a beautiful fashion and then told me to look over it. He designed it that way. Each one of us are fearfully and marvelously made. Are you with me? So we don't have to excuse that. The fact that the Bible takes the time to address Christ through different cultural contexts suggests that God is not ashamed of our diversity. He celebrates our diversity and yet calls us into unity. It is possible to be proud of what you are and still be able to connect with somebody who is quite different from you. That is some of the power of love and the mystery of our faith and the mystery of the whole human experience that we can have diversity and yet still have unity. Yeah. Now, unity, I will admit, is hard to achieve. And the enemy does all he can to fight unity because wherever God sees unity, he dwells in the midst of our unity. He dwells in our unity, whether it's 2,000 or two. He said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The day of Pentecost could not occur until they were in one place with one accord because God loves unity. Say that with me. God loves unity. God loves unity. Say it again. God loves unity. Say it again. God loves unity. If you look over your life, the thing that the enemy has most often thought of anything else in your life is unity. Whether it's in your house, whether it's with your children, whether it's with your spouse, God hate, the, the enemy hates unity because God loves unity. He knows that God inhabits the praises of Israel. He knows that when we touch and agree, things happen. Yokes are broken. Chains fall. Cancers shrink. Tumors dissipate. Diseases have to go. Fatigue comes out of your body. Whenever we connect, glory to God. Whenever you come into agreement in your own house, two are better than one. The Bible said if one falls into the ditch, he has not another to pull him out. But if you have two, one can pull the other one out of a ditch. But you got to have unity. Somebody shout unity. unity. And while Jesus prayed that we might be one, even as he and the Father were also one, he was not afraid to be distinct in and of himself. He and the Father are one, and yet there are things that could be said about Jesus that could not be said about the Father. For example, Jesus died. For example, Jesus was born. Come on, somebody. For example, Jesus slept. The Bible says the Father never sleeps nor slumbers, but it also says that Jesus was sleeping at the bottom of the ship when the storm arose. So Jesus is not afraid to be one while he is still unique in his own personhood. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. This is the mystery of the power of who God is. He thought it not robbery to be equal to God and yet made of himself no reputation. I think that's what the book said. As far as I can remember, that's what the book said. Am I in the book? Tell me, am I in the book? I, I think I'm in the book. I think I'm in the book. It is interesting to understand that God could write to Thessalonia. Uh, he could write to the people that live in Thessalonica, the book of Thessalonia, so that they could have a special 
understanding of the word that is curved to the continuity of their understanding. The metaphors are different, the similes are different, the comparisons are different, so that they will be more adept culturally to, to adapt the understanding of the truth. He is so strong that he can speak the same truth in different languages. Are you with me so far? Let me go a little bit deeper. If you got enough faith, I'm going to go this deep. Not only can God speak in your cultural language, he can speak to anything he wants to speak to. Yeah. He can speak to a mountain and the mountain can hear him and move. He can speak to a wind, the wind can hear him and lay down. He can speak to waves and the waves will calm down. He can speak to frogs and they will all come to Egypt. He can speak to lice and they will attack the Pharaoh's mansion. I don't know how to speak lice, but God knows how to speak lice. He knows how to speak Swahili. He knows how to speak Spanish. He knows how to speak English. Whatever you're speaking, God knows how to speak it. He knows how to speak to you as a woman. He knows how to speak to me as a man. He knows how to speak as a little child and said, suffer not the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of heaven. He can relate to you wherever you are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And that's why this book is called the book of Hebrews, because he is speaking in a language that people of a Hebrew descent would understand. The book is, the book is preoccupied in causing those who are steeped in Judaistic tradition to better understand the revelation of who Jesus is. For without revelation, you would not understand who Jesus is. It is possible for Jesus to be right amongst you. And if you don't have the right revelation, you do not see that he is really there. He dwelt among them. The Bible said he dwelt among them. He came unto his own and his own received them not. He dwelt right in the midst of them and yet they failed to perceive that he was the Christ, the son of the true and living God. Now he has lived for 33 years. He has died on a rugged cross. He has been buried in a borrowed grave. He has been hidden behind a stone. The stone has been rolled away. He has risen from the dead and Hebrews is written in retrospect explaining what has happen to people in a contemporary society that they might embrace the fact that the one that was hung on a tree, whose arms were stretched wide, who, who hung his head in the locks of his shoulders and died until the sun refused to shine and the ground began to tremble. That same Jesus. Look at somebody say, that same Jesus. The same one who busted a wedding party and turned water into wine. The same one that took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000. That same Jesus. Somebody say that same Jesus. The same Jesus who paid tithes by going to a fish's mouth and telling the disciple, I put my tax money in the mouth of a fish. Go in there and get it out. That same Jesus. He speaks in enough languages that he could call the fish over to the bank and cough up cough up the coin that was necessary to pay Rome because God does expect his children to respect authority. There are some that are saying today that they are so Christian that they will disobey the laws of the land, but that is not being Christian, which is to be Christ-like. If Christ had done that, then he wouldn't have paid his taxes. But he said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar and render unto God what is God. It is possible to be obedient to those that he has rule over you and still be true to God. Talk to me, somebody. All of this comes as you mature as a Christian and you grow as a Christian. You grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You have to be careful about making statements when you're too young. Sometimes when you're too young and too immature and not seasoned, you can be old and be immature. If you're not mature enough to have the position that you have, you will lead people to their own peril because your, your truths have not been tested by experience. If there's nothing else we've learned in America, experience does matter. Talk to me, somebody. All of that leads us into an understanding of the book of Hebrews, and we come to wrestle with the fact that this particular writer is endowed with the power and the ability and the articulation of speech and the understanding of truth to show those who were steeped in Judaistic tradition who Jesus is using illustrations that are relative to their culture. See, when I'm preaching at the Potter's house, I make jokes about cornbread and chitlins, but I don't do it when I go to Australia. 
I don't do it when I go to Nigeria. When I go to Nigeria, I talk about Fufu and Joel of Rice. Come on, talk to me. Because when I talk to about Fufu and Joel of Rice, Nigerians know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't talk about Fufu over here because Americans don't know what Fufu is. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You have to, in order to be a global speaker, you have to have global languages, global experiences, global metaphors, global similes, global understanding of the truth. The truth is the same, but the simile and the metaphor that you use to exist Simplify the truth has to be as diverse as you are as a person. So God needed somebody to talk to the Hebrews because salvation came to the Jews first and then to the Greek. It was not appropriate, Jesus said, to give the children's bread to the dogs. He had to first offer it to his own children, those who were in covenant relationship with him. Their rejecting of the bread of life opened up the door for the Gentiles to have an opportunity to receive what somebody else rejected. The truth I want you to understand from that is this. Don't be worried about who doesn't accept Jesus. If they don't accept him, just reach out and grab it. It opened up a door for you. Come on, somebody. But God, who is unwilling that any should be unsaved and that all should repent, is now laboring through the writings of the book of Hebrews that we might have a deeper understanding of who he is. So he starts the book off who says, God, who at sundry times and divers spaces have spoken unto us by the prophets, but in this last day has spoken unto us by his son. It's the same God, but he spoke through different people. He spoke through the prophets in the Old Testament, various prophets and divers manners at different times. But in these last days, he has spoken unto us by his son. And Hebrews begins to correlate what happens to Jesus to ceremonies and rituals that they could relate to. It talks about the Le Levitical priesthood. It talks about, about Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek. These are people that they were familiar with, things that they would understand. It starts talking about him being both the offering and the offerer, that he entered in once by himself with himself and offer it up himself to himself it's a mystery but you'll catch it in a minute all the way up to Jesus you were either the offerer or the offering but Jesus has the distinction of being the first one to be both the offerer and the offering no priest went into the holies of holies and offered up his own blood except Jesus. They brought in the blood of bullocks and the blood of goats. But Jesus comes in. He doesn't need a surrogate blood. He offers up himself. I'm going to go deeper in a minute. Can I go deeper? You will remember when he rose from the dead, he told Mary, don't touch me because I've not yet ascended to my father. The reason he didn't want her to touch him is because he had the offering. He had risen from the dead to offer up himself a living sacrifice to his father, and he didn't want her to contaminate the sanctity of the offering so that when you got ready to plead the blood, it wouldn't have Mary's fingerprints on it. Uh, so he said, distance yourself. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to catch what I already cured. Come on, somebody. I don't want to catch what I already cured. I know, I know you love me, but don't touch me because I got this thing sanctified now. I'm ready to go in. And he entered in once and for all and forever perfected them that are sanctified. So says the word of God. Are y'all with me so far? So we're in the book of Hebrews. Look at your neighbor. Say we're in the book of Hebrews. Let's get in this book of Hebrews. Let's unlock this book of Hebrews. Let's study this book of Hebrews. Let's realize this book of Hebrews. It wants to speak to us out of the ancient of days, out of the wisdom of God's process, out of God revealing himself, the apocalypse, the revelation of who he is. It is not sudden, it's gradual. See, the Bible is a strip tease act. He hid himself in shadows and types all through the Old Testament. And every now and then he would do peekaboo. He'd let you see just a little bit of who he was. Like when Jacob went up on the top of the mountain and there he did peekaboo and revealed himself. And Jacob wrestled with the man. That man was a theophonic manifestation of Jesus Christ. But he couldn't fully show himself because his time had yet not come. Oh, when the Hebrew boys went in the fiery furnace and they said, we lost count, we put in three, and I see a fourth one, he went peekaboo, and he showed himself. Glory to God. And so, so all from Genesis to Revelations, God is stripping himself. 
Glory to God. Oh, glory to God. He's stripping himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Throw your hands up and say, strip for me, Jesus. He stripped in the Old Testament so that they could strip him in the New Testament. They stripped him of his clothing. They cast lots for his garment so that he would be naked before us. And we beheld the wonder of his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. How am I doing this morning? I want you to get this in your word, in your spirit, in your mind. Take notes. Take it in your spirit. I want this word to stay in the earth. The reason I'm teaching it is so it will stay in the earth. I mean for the message to outlive me and outlast me. It is the next generation's uh, uh, not only opportunity, but it is the next generation's responsibility to make sure that we are not left with these foo-foo messages and these popcorn sermons and these airbag illustrations. Somebody's got to know this word because the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are usha and they are life. It will quicken the dead by the power of his word. It will cause a baby to leap in your womb. It will cause a dead man to get up out of the grave. It will cause a tumor to come out of your body. The word of God is power. I said it's power. I said it's power. I said it's power. Young preacher, you need to understand, you don't need a big crowd to preach. I cut my teeth preaching to a small crowd. The devil messed up doing this. He just took me back home where I belong. I'll lay hands on everything in here. I started my church preaching in a room with nobody in there but me. I said, I'm preaching with nobody. I preach. I remember the first drunk that came in late at night to see what this crazy man was doing, standing in an empty room, hollering by himself, playing the piano behind himself while he was preaching. Don't tell me it can't be done. It'll work if you work it. I said it'll work if you work it. If you work it, it'll work. Look at somebody say it'll work if you work it. So in our text today, <laughs> the writer has all in every other chapter leading up to now has led us down a road of legitimizing Christ's authentic, authenticity according to the traditions of the Hebrews of being eligible to be the sacrificial lamb. And not only that, but to become our high priest. Uh -huh. All of the Gospels has proved his genealogies from whence he came, which authenticated the validity that he was the Messiah, the one who was to come, because they did not see him as the Messiah. We have come down to the 13th chapter, and then the writer carefully notes to us that Jesus died without the camp. And I want you to, to take the time to understand that Jesus did not do all he did so that he could get into a building. <laughs> he did everything that he did so he could get out. <clears throat> because if you constrict him in four walls, you have imprisoned him. It was never his will to be trapped in a building. You live in houses, but God didn't need to have a house to live in because earth is his footstool and heaven is his throne. He's too big to be held in what you built. And every now and then God will send something like this to shake you from thinking it's about a building. Hey, hey, hey. It's not about a building. It's not about a building. It never has been about a building. We built the building for you. We didn't build a building for God. God don't need a seat. He sits on the circle of the earth. He has all power in his hand. You can't build no place for God to sit down. He's high and lifted up. See, the problem with the church today is that our God is too small. If you lift him up the way he's supposed to be, your problem will shrink. 
He's bigger than all of your doubts and bigger than all of your fears and bigger than all of your reservations. He's high and lifted up. He holds all power in his hand. Everything belongs to him. He can order all the angels and all of them have got to move. Not only can he speak to the angels, he can command the demons. Come out! And they got to come out. This shot. I'm talking about your God. But I don't want us to miss this truth about him dying outside of the camp. One, you must realize that he loves Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen of her chicks, but ye would not. He wailed over Jerusalem. He wept over Jerusalem. But when he got ready to die, he died outside of Jerusalem. You must realize that him, that the, the writer took the time to let you know that he died outside of the camp so you wouldn't spend all your life trying to get into. My God. My God. My God. Hallelujah. He, he stepped out of the incarceration of religiosity. Is, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. See, religion will always incarcerate. Relationship will always liberate. <laughs> he wrestled with the religious. The religious people were the ones who persecuted him. The sinners were not the ones who persecuted him. It was the religious people who persecuted him because his relationship was an indictment against their religion. He said, you pray often so that you can impress the people with big swelling words and long speeches. He said, but if you really want to pray, go into your secret closet and pray. And see, religion never wants to go into secret. It always wants to be opulent. It wants to be out front. It wants to be in front of the people. It wants to be traditional. It wants to tr teach its traditions. But the Bible said your traditions have made the word of God of no effect. You're more concerned about what they got on than what they got in them. Oh, I'm going to mess with you this morning. I'm going to mess with you a little bit. You're so busy trying to see do they have on makeup and earrings, God is trying to see how their heart is. Religion will always be embarrassed in the face of relationship because religion is all you have to hold on to when you don't have relationship. The fact that the writer tells us that he died outside of the camp is an indictment against the camp. It is an indictment against the camp. He said, I'm through with you. You can't hold me no way. I'm too big to fit in your walls. I'm too big to be fit to fit in your laws. So I eat on the Sabbath day. I heal people when I'm not supposed to. I let, I let the woman with the issue of blood touch me and never rebuked her. And the law said she shouldn't touch me. I'm trying to show you you can't hold me with that stuff. I didn't come to honor it. I came to fulfill it. To, when you fulfill it, you finish with it. Oh, Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to take you into another dimension. Are you ready for this? What I, where I'm getting ready to take you is beyond your walls. You need to get over your walls. You got too many walls. You got too many walls. You got too many walls. Then first we got to read a scripture, and then we got to say a prayer, and then the deacons got to stand up front, and then we got to wear white, and then we got to say, shut up! They're having all this big discussion about whether we should have church or not, or whether we should be in a building or not, and they talk about what would Jesus do. I don't know, because Jesus never saw church. Jesus never saw a pew. Jesus never saw a stained glass window. Jesus never heard a choir sing. Jesus never heard a praise team. Jesus never saw a church. When they started building churches, Jesus had been gone for over 100 years. Jesus saw the desert as a church. Jesus saw preaching on Peter's pulpit as a pulpit. All of this stuff you made don't have nothing to do with the power of God. I don't need a collar on to preach. I don't need a suit on to preach. I don't need a tie on to preach. I can preach in my shower. Oh, the, the stuff I got is on the inside. It's on the inside. He died outside of the camp 
shattered the walls of religiosity shattered the norms of those that thought this was sacred and that was sacred, shattered the routines and the re religious routines and rituals of people. He shattered all of that. That's why they hated him. That's why they sought to kill him because he shattered their theology. He shattered their traditions. He shattered their ideas. He shattered what they believed in. He shattered their concepts. He shattered their routine. I'm talking about God. God is a shatterer. He's a disruptor. And every now and then, God will send something that disrupts your order. I believe the reason we're in the condition we're in right now, because we got, too, as my grandmother would say, too big for our britches. Uh -huh. I don't know. It's not going to move till I say it moves. I'm going to control everything. No, the Democrats is right. No, the Republicans is right. Everybody's already God said, let me shut you all up. I'll send something you can't legislate. I'll send something you're not ready for. I'll send something that brings you to your knees. Oh, you don't want to worship me? I will bring you to your knees. I will make you have to believe me. I will make you have to serve me. I will make you have to call on my name. I will blow up your parties. I will come on your cruise ships. I will disrupt your Senate. I will break up your courtroom. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. And beside me there is no other. That's who we're talking about this morning. We're talking about Jesus who died without the camp. He died without the camp. He went outside of all of that so that we might have, this is a big word, access. He died outside of the camp, preacher, so we could have access. If he'd have died in the wall, I couldn't get in. <laughs> He died outside the wall so that the heathen and the whore, the hypocrite and the liar, the fornicator and the fictitious, the whoremonger and the ill repute could be able to get to him. If he'd have died inside the wall, I couldn't have reached him. But he put himself out. He bled out. Look at somebody say, he bled out. I'm going to take some time with this this morning. I feel like teaching this thing. Look at your neighbor and say, something's going to happen in here this morning. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen on your couch. Something's going to happen in your kitchen. Something's going to happen while you're trying to make coffee. Something's going to happen while you're sitting on the side of the bed. Something's going to happen while you're stuck in your car. Why is something's going to happen? God! He died outside the camp so that we would have access. No lambs were to be killed outside of the camp. <laughs> no lambs were to be offered up outside of the camp. There was a specific place for a lamb to be offered up. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was a burnt offering. A burnt offering is a sin offering. He died for the sins of the world, but he didn't die where his predecessors died. Every lamb who was a foreshadow of Jesus died on an altar, on a sacrifice inside the camp. He said, they were shadows of me. The former things are passed away. To distinguish himself, from his placeholders, he died outside of the camp. In theater, when they're setting up for a movie scene, they don't have the actors play the roles while they're in setup. So they have setups. These are people who are acting like you, who are posted and stand in in your position so you don't have to use your creative energy during a setup. When everything is set up, they don't bring the stars out till everything's set up. When they're set up and they're ready to roll, then they bring the star out. Oh, y'all don't hear that. All of those lambs and all of those books and all of those books, they were stand-ins. But when that which was perfect has come, that which was in part is done away with. When the, set, when the stage was set and everything was in order, that's when they brought out the star. <laughs> and he says he died outside of the camp. Watch this. 
so that we would have no continuing city. That means that if we're going to walk with God, we got to be fluid. We can't be rigid. This is the way it's supposed to be done. No, no continuing city. We're, we're, we're mobile. We're nomadic. We're fluid. Glory to God. Some people say they can't preach certain places. I can preach anywhere. I can preach anywhere. I don't need a crowd. I don't need a mic. I don't need none of that stuff. I don't need an organ. I don't need a drum. I will stomp my foot and <laughs> preach this house to the floor cracks. Oh! You don't have to have all them accoutrements when you got the real deal. If you can preach in America, you can preach in Africa. If you can preach in Africa, you can preach in Australia. If you can preach in Australia, you can preach in New Zealand. If you can preach in New Zealand, you can preach in Brazil. Because two plus two is four. I don't care where you go. I want you to have the word so good that you don't have to pick where you preach. If you want to hoop, I can hoop. If you want to holler, you can holler. If you want me to sit in lecture and talk calmly to you out of the word of God, I can do that too. So don't fail to invite me just because I'm hollering today. That's just, that's just how I like to do it. But if I go over there where I need to do it another kind of way, I can do that too. He doesn't want us to become locked in to stuff or to people or to things. Every now and then, God will use somebody you didn't expect. If Bishop ain't preaching, I ain't coming. You might miss heaven. Because bishop is temporal. Yeah. Heaven is eternal. Yeah. And every now and then, God will bring somebody in you never heard of, right. and they wreck the place yeah. just to show you that it's not about who you thought. Yeah. Am I right about this thing? Yeah. So he says, we have no continuing city. We, we, we have to be fluid. We have to be mobile. And a lot of us don't function well without stability. Where are we going? What time we get there? Where are we going to stay? What are we going to wear? Walking with God means you have to be able to walk with unanswered questions. Unanswered questions is the womb where faith is born. Faith is born in uncertainty. Faith is born in transition. Faith is born in chaos. Faith is born without answers. And some of you are holding God hostage. I'm not going to move till you answer my question. He's going to move around you. Come on. He told Abraham, go to a city that I'll show you. Offer your son on a mountain I'll tell you of. What does that mean? I don't know. When you get there, I'll tell you. You have to be willing to pack your stuff, put your baby on the horse, and ride out there and not be able to answer questions. Yeah. Daddy, I see the knife. I see the wood. Where is it? God will provide. Yes, sir. I want to talk to some God will provide people. Yes, Are there any God will provide people in here? God will provide people. You don't have all the answers. You don't have it all fixed up in your mind, but you know that God will provide. You don't know where you're going to go. You don't know what you're going to do. But you know that God will provide. Are there any God will provide people? Have you ever gone through a time in your life that you couldn't answer questions? And you didn't even want to talk to people because they couldn't handle the fact that you were walking into uncertainty. Peter, when he stepped off the boat, he didn't know what was going to happen. He just obeyed the word of God. If you obey the word of God, we still can't explain it. He just did it. I don't know whether God put rocks up under his feet, held his feet up off the water. All I know is that he walked on the water. I don't know how I got here. All I know is that he brought me here. I wasn't planning on Dallas. I didn't wake up in the morning saying, Lord, send me to Dallas. I didn't pray and say, Lord, I'm believing you for Dallas. I'm believing you for a church I haven't seen called the Potter's House. I was praying for West Virginia. I was in love with West Virginia. He broke that up. God will disrupt your life to get you where he wants you to go. 
and, and, and what he is trying to tell us, let me get down to this point, because <laughs> I love to preach. Uh, see, see, see what he's trying to, to, to shatter, that Hebraistic ideology that makes them think that certain things can only be done a certain way. He is now proving to us that not only is he the Lamb of God, but he is also our high priest. That he has entered beyond the veil. Beyond the veil. Yeah. They were familiar with the veil. Yeah. They had the veil in the wilderness. Right. The veil, you remember, I taught you about the veil right. between the most holy place and the holies yes. of holy. They knew what the veil was. They had the veil in the temple, Solomon's temple. It had a veil in it. They knew that that was the veil, but then when they said that he went beyond the veil, they began to realize that those were shadows mm -hmm. of the veil between heaven and earth. Yeah. He went beyond the veil yeah. and entered in once and for all. Yeah. And let me show you about the veil. When they pierced his side, all the shadows ripped. You're going to get that when you get home. When, when they pierced his side, the veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom because the veil in the temple was a placeholder. It was a placeholder. It, it was a way of God showing you that he was going to put his glory behind a veil. It was a shadow of which Christ is the reality. So when Christ came and they pierced his side, they, they ripped the veil. <laughs> because because what, what, the, what the veil, that's right, that, that is the veil, which is to say is his flesh. That was the word, that's exactly what the word of God said. His flesh was the veil. So when they pierced his side, the veil in the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom. Because you don't need the shadow when the reality has come. You understand what I'm saying? And then he goes beyond the veil yes. into the heavens to offer up the blood on the real mercy seat. Yes. Come on, Bishop. It is this book that teaches us that we have not a high priest who cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmity, yes. Yes. tempted in all points like us. We are yet without sin. He is our high priest. Yes. Yes. I want to set this up. As our high priest, since it is not our culture, to have high priests, I want to explain this. The high priest is the mediator between God and man mm. and between man and God. Uh -huh. Those are two different things. He spoke God's will to the people. He spoke the people's needs to God. So the people, when the priest went in, he went in not just for himself, but also for the people. Okay, so whatever sacrifice you gave the priest actually offered it up. You got to understand that he, because he's the mediator. Okay. So you had to give it to the mediator and the mediator had to worship the father with it. Okay. He stood in the gap and made up the difference. You don't see the nation of Israel going in the holies of holies. Even the priest could only go in one time a year. Okay. And he went in once and for all. Now, the difference between Jesus and the other priests is that the priest had to go in with your sins and his own. But Jesus, yeah, but, but Jesus didn't have any sins to confess. So he went in with only your sins to offer up. So he is my mediator. The Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is, watch this, the man, Christ Jesus. Not the God, Christ Jesus, the man, Christ Jesus. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. There's one mediator between God and man. No, no other mediator. One, one mediator. Not me. No, no, it's not my wife. It's not Elder Flip Flap. It's not Bishop White Jack. It's none of them people. You got one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Whoever liveth, ever liveth to make intercession for us, he lives to intercede for you. That's right there, that's a big shout. Have you ever thought about that? He lives to intercede for you. You might call me and I might be busy. He ain't never too busy to intercede for you. You might have to call me back. It might be three days before I got back to you. He, he ever liveth to make intercessions for us. And then the Bible tells us, you don't have a high priest who cannot be touched 
by the feeling of your infirmity, tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin, is telling us not only can he be touched by your faith, he can be touched by your feelings. So all those churches that are telling the people not to have feelings, you're telling me not to touch him. Because he can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. And sometimes he's the only one who can be touched by the feeling of your infirmity. Because other people act like they don't get it. <laughs> they don't want to get it. They talk about what you did, but they don't talk about why you did it. They don't understand how you feel. God can be touched by the feelings of your infirmity. Not because he did it, because the Bible goes on, he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. But he still understands you enough to intercede for you. Okay? Now, to my text. So he says, by, by him, therefore, say that, by him, therefore. See, the therefore, whenever you see therefore in a text, you always got to read back. Because the case is laid before the statement is made. By him, therefore, therefore, ought to make you say wherefore. So anytime you read therefore, you got to read back at least a chapter to see, because this is the culmination of the chapter. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of prayer. Now, you can't offer it without him. You can only offer it by him. So that means that he worships the Father with our praise. So when you praise God, it's like bringing your lamb to the priest. Your praise is your offering. By him, therefore, <laughs> let us offer. Now let's bring that offer. Offer means I don't have to accept it. You see, offer me your pocketbook. Just the whole thing, just, just offer it to me. Yeah, just offer it. I don't want it. <laughs> she offered it. I didn't accept it. It is possible to offer something that's not accepted. <laughs> By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. I'm not sure it's going to get there. It's got, I'm, I'm sure it's got to come by him. But I am offering him the sacrifice of praise. Wait a minute. The sacrifice of praise? Oh, we're in Hebrews 13, but back in 10, 9, 8, and 7, the sacrifice was bullocks and goats. That seems my praise is my goat. <laughs> My praise is my bullet. My praise is my lamb. My praise is a living thing. That's why I said, let everything that have breath. That's why the prophet said, the grave cannot praise you because you are forbidden to offer a dead animal to God. You have to offer life to life. Uh, you, you, you have to offer... You have to, it has to be a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. Now, praise is a sacrifice. Okay, not all praises, but what he will accept is the sacrifice of praise. If it don't hurt you, it don't move you. <laughs> if it don't cost you something, it doesn't move him. So a lot of this lip service that we're giving doesn't move God because our lips are saying something that our hearts don't validate. We're not really connected to it. And sometimes it doesn't move God because it's just easy. What really moves God is when you're broken yes. and you're praising. Yes. You're hurting yes. and you're praising. Yes. You're going through a tough time yes. and you're praising. Yes. 
Your flesh says stay at home and you praise him. Anytime you offer him the sacrifice of praise, Jesus offers it up to the Father because he's touched by how you feel about it. Anything you give God something that you have no emotional attachment to. Like you see people come to the altar, take all my junk, Lord, I don't want it no more. Take my cigarette, take my cussing, take all this stuff away, Lord. Take it away, take it away, Lord, take it away. Just take all this stuff, I don't want to take it. Take it away with the Lord. No, 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 no. you don't want it, he don't want it either. <laughs> <laughs> what really blesses God is when you give him something you still have an attachment to. Come on, Bishop. Oh, y'all ain't going with me. Y'all ain't going with me. Y'all ain't going with me because I'm about to get down deep into something. What really blesses God is not when you give something you don't love, but when you love something and you give it up to him. Like Abraham, like Abram gave up Hagar. He loved her. Sarah put her out. It's easy for somebody to put out something they have no attachment to. But Abraham slept with her and held her. She carried his child. He'd heard her thoughts, her secrets, her tears, her fears. He was bond to the bond woman. Think about it. And, hey, and, and Sarah comes in and says, put her out. Her and a nappy head kid, put them both out. You know how y'all can be. <laughs> the other woman, never mind the fact that you the one brought her in. You the one told me to do it. Now it don't work out right. Now you mad at me about your idea not working out. Never mind all that stuff. You know how y'all will switch. And we be sitting there with our mouth hanging over talking about, but you said, <laughs> the same woman who said do it, now is mad because he did it, and now wants him to put out who she brought in. Only problem is he is bond to the bond woman. She's had his first child. She gave him something that, that Sarah couldn't. The child is about 12 years old. You ain't gonna raise nobody 12 years and not be bond to them. She don't, Sarah don't care nothing about her. Because, because she thinks their success mocks her. Can I stop by and deal with a little jealousy? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jealousy will destroy justice. Yes, it will. My God. It'll make you vicious. Yeah. It'll make you do mean things. Yes. And worse than jealousy is really envy. Yeah. She envied her. Yeah. Heard him back here giggling last night. Look, ain't nothing that funny. <laughs> How come he ain't giggling with me? Ooh, they got quiet in here, Jesus. <laughs> I must have hit something. The men looking nervous and the women looking convicted. So Sarah says, put her and her child out. And Abraham says, get out of my face. I'm not doing that. And God had to talk to Abraham. This, this is something I'm going to throw this in. This is free. It won't cost you nothing. God have to talk to your husband. Yes, he does. You're saying it more often ain't going to change you. You got to stop talking and start praying. Because God knows exactly how to talk to your husband. I'm going to go deeper down. God have to talk to your children. Because it comes to a certain age, they're not listening at you. And you're breaking your dishes you got to buy back. Ain't gonna make no difference. It don't care. I don't care. No, but don't break them dishes because you the one gotta buy them back. <laughs> Throwing plates and stuff and then looking for something to eat off of. <laughs> See, and, and, and what has to happen is God comes down and says, 
hearken unto the voice of thy wife. The woman is right. So Abraham then fixes the lunch, a flag and a wine, and takes her out and says, I'll never forget you. I'll probably think about you the rest of my life. I'll always love you. But I love him more. And I got to show him that this is how much I love him. Tears running down my face. Your image is burned in my head. When I close my eyes, I see you. I hear the way you laughed. I feel your touch on my skin. Don't think it wasn't real. Don't think it's dead. It's still alive. But I'm giving you to God to show him that I love you more. This is the sacrifice of praise. See, as long as we talk about bullocks and goats and turtle doves and peace offerings, you can shout. But when we bring it to your life, now you can feel it. By him, therefore, let us offer up. Oh, anybody can dance and clap. The sacrifice yes, sir. Yes, sir. of praise. The one that got away. The no you said that you didn't even mean no. Being exiled into a situation that don't make you happy. But it's right. That is the sacrifice of praise. And with your heart broken and tears falling in the night that nobody can see. When you lay there with tears running down your cheeks and lift your hands and offer him the fruit of your lips. You can't have fruit without relationship. The fruit of your lips. What what you had left <laughs> when the relationship is over, that's fruit. You, you understand? Come on, come on, come on. That, that's fruit. And I can feel it in the room right now. That somebody knows what I'm talking about. I'm not talking to somebody that don't know. Somebody in this room knows what I'm talking about. To have to make tough decisions. Yes, and decisions that honestly you didn't really mean. If you'd have done what you really meant to do, you'd have went in the other direction. But, but by him, therefore, yes. let us offer the sacrifice of praise. Not with bitterness, not with attitude, not with animosity, not with anger. but with praise. The fruit of our lips. The fruit of our lips. Can I I hone in on this just a minute? The reason that God wants you to praise him out of your mouth is because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaker. You can dance, your feet can say one thing, and your heart can say something else. You can clap your hands, and your mind be on what you're going to cook when you get back home. But if you start talking out of your mouth, whatever's in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. And God says, I want to hear your heart be ventilated. 
We're living in a time now of stress and anxiety and emotional illness and mental depravity because we're all clogged up. We need, we need what's in our heart to be ventilated out of our mouth. You're too quiet about how you feel. You're too quiet about what's going on inside of you. You're too quiet about what you deal with by yourself. You're too quiet about what you hold on the inside, yeah. calling yourself being tough, calling yourself being masculine. That ain't masculine. It's unhealthy. It's detrimental. It's destroying you. It turns into cancers and diseases and frustrations and, and, and animosity and anger and aneurysms and Alzheimer's. Some of y'all got Alzheimer's because you held everything in. When you open up your spirit to God and let out of your mouth and you begin to say, I love you, Lord. I love you anyway. I love you. I praise you. I praise you. I'm hurting, but I praise you. I'm lonely, but I praise you. I'm broken, but I praise you. Oh, God, I ache at night, but I praise you. I glorify you. I'm going to stand right here and let the glory of the Lord come into my spirit. I dare you to try. I dare every one of you that's watching, every one of you that's mourning, every one of you that's suffering, every one of you that's dealing with something, every one of you that's going through something. I dare you to open up your mouth and let it out of your mouth. I dare you right where you are. It might look silly, but right where you are, lift your hands and open your mouth and let the praises of God, the praises of God, the praises, the praises, the praises, the praises come on. Up out of your belly, oh God! Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh God! Oh God! I'll probably always have no continuing city. I'll never be understood the way I wanted to be understood. I'll never be held like I wanted to be held. I'll never get what I wanted to get. But if I never get it, God, as long as I got you, I can make it. And I glorify you and I give you the praise and I magnify you and I thank you. And I refuse to get to this stage in my life and be miserable and disgruntled and angry with everybody and vindictive and trying to get even. I lift my hands and I open my mouth and I give you the praise. I give you the praise, God. 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 That's why I'm telling you, he bled out. He bled out so you could get in. He bled out so you could have access. He bled out so that you he could hear your cry. He bled out so the guilty could come to the cross. He bled out so you could have access to come and call upon his name. He bled out for you. He shed his blood for you. He hemorrhaged for you. His blood came streaming down. He died within your reach. His blood is falling right on you right now, right on your brokenness, right on your frustration. I'll speak to every brokenhearted mother. He bled out for you. He bled out for you, mama. If the kids don't come, if they don't honor you, if one of them's locked up in jail, if one of them's dead, he bled out for you. He bled out. Nobody understands how you feel as a mama. Nobody understands how you feel as a daddy, but he bled out. He bled outside the camp so you could go to him at 2 o'clock in the morning and touch the hem of his garment and be made Oh, He bled out for you. He bled out. He bled out for you. He bled out. He bled. He bled. He bled. You don't have to lie. You don't have to fake it. You don't have to pretend. You can come boldly to the throne of grace. And let me tell you something. If you come, he'll hear you. If you come, he'll hear you. If you call on him, he'll answer you. If you call on him, he'll respond to you. I dare you to do like Hannah and act like a drunk woman and get in the presence of God and let the Holy Ghost touch your heart. I dare you to open your mouth this Sunday morning and give your heart to God. Whatever's been on you, whatever's been on your nerves, whatever had you upset, I dare you to open your mouth. The devil don't want you to open your mouth because the power of life and death is in the tongue. The power of life and death is in your mouth. Lift your hands and open your mouth and give your God the sacrifice. Oh, y'all playing with me. Give your God the sacrifice of praise. 
your prayer. Give your God the sacrifice of prayer. I don't care what I look like. I don't care what I got on. I don't care if I mess up my makeup. I don't care if I mess up my hair. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Open wide your mouth. He bled out. 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 He bled out for you. He bled out for your sin. He bled out for your worry. He bled out for your pain. He bled out for your problem. He bled out. He bled out for your predicament. He bled out for your deliver. He bled out for your praise, for your crisis. Open your mouth and praise him now. Praise him till the blood hits you. Praise him till the blood hits your marriage. Praise him till the blood hits your house. Praise him till the blood hits your child. Praise him till demons tremble. Praise him till hell gets nervous. Praise him continually. Praise him habitually. Praise him nonstop. Praise him till you get healed. Praise him till you get loose. Praise him till you get peace. Praise him till you get power. Praise him till you get victory. Praise him till you see results. Praise him till the yoke breaks. Praise him till the door opens. Praise him till the wall moves. Feel the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. He's here right now. He's here right now. He's here right now. He's here right now. Somebody help me pray with him. Somebody help me pray with him. Somebody pray with him. He bled out. He bled out. Look at your neighbor and say, he bled out. He bled out. He bled out. He bled out. Out to your house. Out to your car. He bled out. to your daughter. Out to your son. Out to your wife. Out to your children. Out to your husband. Out to your mama. Out to your daddy. He bled out. He bled out. He bled out. He bled out. You might be in isolation, but he bled out. You might have contracted the virus. He bled out. You might be diagnosed with cancer. He bled out. You might be HIV positive, but he bled out. He bled. 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 Ow! Have your way, Jesus. <laughs> Today, my brothers and sisters, the anointing of God is in this room. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The blood of Jesus. He bled out. He bled outside the camp. He bled where you can get it. If you go to hell, you go to hell on purpose. You don't have to go to hell. He bled out so the crackhead could find him. The dope dealer could find him. The whoremonger could find him. The prostitute could find him. 
Black folk could find him. White folk could find him. Brown folk could find him. Homosexuals can find him. Bisexuals can find him. HIV positive can find him. Don't you sit in the church and not get what you need from God. Open your mouth to God and cry out. He bled out for you. He bled out for you. He bled out for me. He bled out for me. I ain't gonna worry about you. He bled out for me. 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 I don't know about you, but he bled out for me. He bled out for my wife. He bled out for my children. He bled out for my grandchildren. He bled. He bled. He bled. He bled. He bled. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Tell the devil, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. That's why I'm not worried about what the paper says, about what the world says, about what the doctor says. I listen at all of them, but I worry about none of them because he bled out. He shot, shot, shot. Woo! Glory! He bled out. He bled out. I ain't gonna let you drive me crazy. You can give it up right now. Everybody go crazy before I go crazy. And he bled out for me. Glory to God. You may not like me, but he bled out for me. You may talk about me, but he bled out for me. Turn up your nose when you see me, but he bled out for me. Yes! That's the gospel. My brothers and my sisters, watching from all over the world. Watching from all over the world. There is not a continent you're on that his blood will not reach. There's not a language that you speak that his blood will not touch. There's not a circumstance that you face that his blood will not touch. You may be way down under in Australia. You may be past Australia in New Zealand. You may be on the southernmost tip of Cape Point in Cape Town, South Africa. He bled out and the blood is right there for you. Oh my God, you may be on the eastern tip of Africa watching from Kenya. He bled out there too. He bled in China and Japan. In India, he bled out for you. Talk to me, in Iraq and Iran, he bled out for you. In Germany and Russia, he bled out for you. He bled out for Moscow. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. He bled out for Tel Aviv. He bled out for Lebanon. He bled out for North America. He bled out for Canada. He bled out for Antarctica. Wherever there is a soul, there is a drop of blood. Just one drop. If just one drop, if just one drop can give you coronavirus, I want to tell you about another drop. One drop, one drop, one drop, one drop of the blood of Jesus. You can catch the Holy Ghost. The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Look at somebody and say, one drop will heal cancer. One drop will heal leukemia. One drop will kill the coronavirus. One drop. One drop. One, 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 one,
sisters, listen to me, all over the world. CNN got bad news. Fox got bad news. MSNBC got bad news. The British papers have bad news. The London Times has bad news. The New York Times has bad news. The Washington Post has bad news. But the Potter's House got good news. There is good news. I got good news. Good news, good news. I got good news. Good news, good news. I got good news. Good news, good news. He bled out. Yeah. He bled out. He bled out. Yeah. He bled out. So if you want to be saved, if you need to be saved, if you used to be saved, if you drifted away, if you are uncertain about your soul, I don't know about your status. I don't know whether you've touched anybody who touched anybody who touched anybody. I don't know nothing about that. I don't have no test kits to see. But if you're in sin, We can fix it right now. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he's risen from the dead, God will do a miracle in your life. I didn't preach to you to make you a church person. I didn't preach to you so you could come to my building. I preached to you that you might come to the living fountains of water and find eternal life for your soul. I preach to you so that you could be washed in the blood of the Lamb. So that your guilt and shame could be cleansed. So all in voices can stop talking in your head. So that you can be whole within yourself. So you can stop desperately needing other people to give you a happiness that they are in search of themselves. I preach to you right now to tell you that God will get you through this age you're in. This stage you're going through. All of the issues that are going on with the stage of life you're in, he bled out for that. He bled out for hormonal changes. He bled out for family changes. He bled out for emotional changes. He bled out for financial changes. He bled out for people moving out of houses. He bled out for whatever is on your mind right now. He bled out. He bled out. He bled out, he bled out. He bled out. for you. And if you would bow your heads and pray and humble yourself and say, Lord Jesus, I need you like I never needed you in my life. I believe that you died for my sins, shed your blood on the cross for me. You bled out so I could come in. You bled out so I could come in. The door is wide open. I'm walking in. I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you my future. And I thank you that by faith, not in me, but in you, by faith, I am saved right now. Everybody praise him right now.